first, like, tell me about everything you got going on up there and what, what you got going. Um, you know what? We, uh, you know, you and I met in California. I loved it there, and I was working in uh, professional hockey um, as the head of performance for the Anaheim Ducks, which isn't too far from uh, where we met. And, uh, you know, we loved it there, but ultimately that job is uh, very time consuming and it took me away from my family a lot. So when I got an opportunity to kind of get out on my own terms, it was, uh, it was one that I took and, uh, you know, we were thinking about staying in California, had a couple of different things I could do, but ultimately being back home is, you know, where my family wanted to be. And we've never, we haven't really had support with our kids in a long, long time. And now we do. So that's a bit of a game changer. You'll, you'll see that as you continue to grow your family. Um, yeah, I'm seeing it now. I'm yeah. It. Yeah. I no doubt with a new baby, um, the yeah. support is, uh, is massive. And I kind of forgot that, you know, so we were planning on coming back to Canada in June and with all the coronavirus stuff, we just, uh, packed up and ended up leaving in March. And uh, mm -hmm. I have my facilities, uh, ETS, uh, Elite Training Systems in Ontario. That's the East Coast of Canada or closer to the East Coast. I have um, three facilities there, um, all kind of within, one of them's kind of with, they're all within like municipally owned buildings. So, you know, I've, I have organizational deals with, uh, you know, hockey, soccer, and then a university. So those are, uh, you know, those aren't going anywhere. Thankfully, with all the coronavirus stuff, where a lot of you know people are going out of business and stuff, which is awful. Uh, we're pretty fortunate that we've built out some pretty kind of long-standing relationships with contractual obligations and what have you. So, um, but I moved my family to the west coast of Canada, in uh, Kelowna, British Columbia, uh, for a couple of reasons. I have business out here. Um, I do some consulting with a hockey academy that is. Uh, uh, does a ton of business out this way across uh, Canada. Mm -hmm. And then it's a hotbed for hockey players in the off season, you know, similar to orange County. And uh, that makes sense. Yeah. So I had some clients here that were kind of bugging me to do something out here and it's the closest to California as you're going to get in Canada. So <laughs> lots of uh, mountains and water and uh, wineries and whatever. So nice. we just decided to set up shop here and, barring coronavirus stuff i was traveling usually every three to five weeks back to ontario just to check in with my staff and do whatever i needed to do back there but i haven't done that in a while so uh you know that's that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it um i got my hands in a lot of different things which uh is good and bad as you know and uh learning that yeah and uh yeah just trying to kind of continue on and, and build some new business and build some business outside of traditional SNC and what have you just to, you know, as you know, there's no re real retirement plan. If you're on the private side, it's kind of, uh, you know, build, uh, build it however you can and, and make sure it's, uh, you know, robust and uh, sustainable. Right. So that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Love it. Love it. Yeah. And, and um, it's cool. I, it seems like it was so long ago. We did draft training together and had a, really good success with the guys um mm -hmm. they're actually starting to come back in now that's um, cool just got back um and it's crazy because a lot of those guys that were even undrafted ended up playing this year so yeah we had it was awesome just just like success from the combine point of view but also success from like a long-term like you know they, they stayed successful throughout the season camp they stayed healthy minus joe but which was kind of an unfortunate accident that you couldn't really predict but um could you talk kind of towards like the planning process that we had for combine from your from your point of view and how you guys were thinking about organizing the structure and building that out for combine but also for off season yeah it was um it was my first kind of experience with the nfl like combine prep that was definitely something new to me and uh you know getting to work with you and uh chad our mutual friend um, was, you know, something I was jumped at, you know, you know, or something I jumped at, sorry, because I just a different experience, you know, I, I took yeah. on, you know, some clients that I maybe wouldn't have taken on regularly uh, during my last kind of year in California. And, 
they ended up being just like the combine thing was, you know, some of my best experiences, you know, it's something kind of outside of what I normally do. Um, you know, so when we sat down with Chad initially and we just started talking about, you know, the, how it's going to go and whatever, a lot of it, to be honest, was just, you know, we didn't even know what we were going to get, you know, and I know you've been through it a bunch of times, but, yeah. you know, and Chad, I think has been through it more than me, but still not as much, you know, so that, I think part of it was just trying to, okay, like, Hey, if we get guys in on this date, here's what we're going to do. If we get guys here, here's what we're going to do. It was a lot of like having a whole bunch of scenarios in our heads and at least, you know, communicating about those scenarios to really, you know, make sure that we gave every participant a good experience, you know, and, and made it as thorough as possible. And I think Chad did a really good job, you know, at that as he was kind of on site more than me and you know just adaptability and I, I think that's the way training has to be now you know yeah. as you know like you get guys that or girls that you know hey I'm, I'm here for three weeks or I'm here for two weeks and you know even Burl came in kind of late with us and it's like well you know you, you could sit back as a traditional strength coach and say, Oh, we got to like, we got to start here and we got to do this. It's like, well, too bad, man. Like you got, here's your time, get it done. You know? And I think that's one of the things that it reinforced with me is that none of that shit matters. I mean, yeah. In the perfect world you got, you know, we're, we're doing our summer programs here and it's like 14 weeks. There's going to be maybe two guys that fall into the 14 week cycle. Right. The majority of it is going to be, you know if we're lucky eight to ten yeah maybe eight you know so it's like your best laid plans is is are not always going to get executed on so I think that you know first and foremost that was an eye-opener for me on the excuse me on the football side and and also not putting enough stock in the fact that all those guys are coming from different schools yeah like different I never realized how vastly different (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and nothing <clears throat> nothing negative just you know a guy that came went or uh came to us from tennessee compared to a guy that came from <clears throat> um utah and a guy that came from a school i've never heard of to hawaii like nobody it was like nobody spoke the same language right, right. like oh we never squatted or oh all we did was olympic lift or you know, all we did was, you know, velocity based training, whatever. And I was just like, holy shit, like, how, how do we go about grouping these guys into stuff that they can actually, not that they can't do it, but, you know, again, you got a snapshot of time. So it's like, we got to get super basic, right. And, and just phase it in that sense. And I think that's what, you know, our our programming kind of spoke to is, you know, Hey, we're going to pull, so you can trap bar, you can, you know, pull from the rack, you can do this. Like you're, there was a drop down menu of, you know, things you could do as an athlete to accomplish the goal from a programming perspective. And I thought that was smart because man, there was a myriad of like abilities, you know, from the football side, guys who had never done X, Y, and Z and guys who had only done X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So that I was kind of floored by that, to be honest, because Hockey is a little bit more, you know, everybody kind of, you know, there's not that there's one way to do it, but as you know, with NCAA, like you could spend four years at a top school and, and never learn how to hang clean or, or, you know what I mean? Like maybe that's a bad example, but you know what I'm saying? There, but that's very prevalent yeah. now. Like a lot of guys don't, there's a yeah. lot of guys won't learn. Or like, it seems like there's a lot of polarization in, in college where, people are very, very heavily on one side. It's like, we only do velocity based training or we only do heavy lifting or we only do like bodybuilding. It's, it's crazy. It's like people adopt one, one philosophy, it seems sometimes. And, and, and oh, yeah. it. so it, we saw like guys that were, I remember being in the gym and they'd be like, Oh, my coach told me to never do that. Yeah. <laughs> it would be something like a glute ham or something. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. Which is bizarre, you know, like, to me, it being a coach means you have to, you're the ultimate, uh, uh, picture of adaptability in my opinion, right? Like if I don't adapt to, you know, someone who's 
6'6", 310 pounds compared to someone who's 6'1", 195, like you have to adapt. You, you yeah. can't all fit those guys into the same bucket, you know, and any of the football guys that I've usually dealt with have been typically veteran guys and or injured. You know, they're like badly injured. They're coming off an injury. And that's usually where, you know, I have, you know, doctors and therapists and stuff that I work with that will include me in that recovery process or whatever. So to have all these guys coming in for combine, you know, young, healthy, you know, like kind of on the other end of it to some degree was also a cool part of it. And, you know, the, I think it kind of spoke to, again, the adaptability of the programming and making sure that, you know, we are filling all those buckets of speed, strength, power. We were matching it with what you were doing on the field. And, you know, I, I, I was always trying to get out to the field just to see what you were doing, because, you know, for me, that's, it's like the same thing in hockey. Like I always make sure that I can, I know what they're doing on the ice either before they get to me or after, like, that's a big part of it. And, you know, I think that was a good part about the communication that we had was just, we always knew what was going on. You know, we always knew what windows we had to kind of, you know, Hey, we can, we can kind of get them a little bit today if we need to, Yeah. we can add a little bit if, or we can take some off because of what they did or whatever. And yeah, I know in speaking with some of the guys like that was, that was definitely part of it that they did like, you know, with the fact that there was, there was always crossover, you know, they could see you, your staff in the gym class and you know, Chad spent more time than I did on the field, but I did spend, you know, I always make sure to pay attention to what you guys were doing just because it's, you know, it's part of being a coach, right? Like you see those guys come through the door and if they're gassed every single time, it's like, well, my red flags are starting to go up. It's like, you know, you know, that balance or that rhythm, whatever you want to call it has to exist, especially with such a condensed event, like the combine, which is, I've been to it a few times and is probably the most intense thing I've ever been at. You know? Yeah. A lot. yeah. No, and no combine this year, which is just crazy. I don't know if you heard that. No, I didn't. Yeah. Combine has been canceled. Wow. So now they're saying only pro day. So like, I, I think they're going to try to do some regional events, but I'm, I'm assuming that the NFL scouts and staff are going to be prevented from coming. So it'll probably be some type of live stream situation. Um, and this year, this year we have five guys, so it's a completely different thing, wow. but out of those five guys, it's like two of them are going top five. And the rest of them kind of know where they place. Um, and as you know, like running at pro day is a hand time. So hmm. it's a lot less pressure to perform. And, and also, since it is pro day, it's generally later in March. Like one guy's going to be end of March. One guy's going to be mid-March. Like it's a lot less pressure this year. Like last year we had guys that kind of depended, depended on us, like, making them faster, stronger, bench 225. This year, our guys are like a different, it's a, <laughs> it's a whole different thing. It's a whole different thing. So, and also we couldn't have high numbers. Yeah, we couldn't have high numbers just because the virus and if we got shut down, like we move like, it's, it, it'll feel, it feels like, um, it just feels like a regular off season, just kind of like low stress, like more fun. Like it's pretty cool. It's, it's, a lot, it's a lot different than last year. Um, yeah, that was in, that was intense. That, that's definitely, I picked up on that too. There's just a lot going on, you know, and I think that was, uh, it was interesting because that, you know, the hockey part of that, and that's why I keep referring back to, because that's where I've worked in and it's, it was just different. And I played football. So like, I like that, you know, I like the football environment. It was, you know, when it was bench day, I've never seen guys more excited to do bench. You know what I mean? Like it was, uh, you don't really get that too much in this sport. So it was, uh, yeah. yeah part about, like, what, how's hockey from a, I mean, first my good goal perspective, like environment, but how, do, how do you plan your microcycles and how do you plan your, your structure? Like how is it different than football? Well, you know what I think first and foremost, like lifting is a part of football, you know, like, you know, field work, sprinting, lifting like that's all kind of ingrained in in the football whereas um i think in in hockey it's still not there you know it's obviously 
a lot better than it used to be, but um, you know, the old joke, you know, you can't score goals from the gym, you know, that's still used, you know, that's still used by, you know, hockey executives and, and whatever, which is stupid in my opinion, because it, it speaks to, you know, neglecting preparation, you know, more than anything, and especially with the, the travel schedule of an NHL team now, which is just insane. You know, there was a stretch there when I was with the Ducks, you know, 17 days on the road or 21 days on the road. I think we played 12 to 13 games. We practiced like it was just ri ridiculous. Like you, you can't, you can't even imagine getting into a hotel room at 2 a.m. We got to play the next day. I like guess just you talk about, you know, tough conditions for recovery and, you know, maximizing performance or, you know, you, want to use. It's, you, you better, you better understand the sport and you better understand what guys need and, and what have you. And I think that's, you know, comparatively with football, it's, it's more like there's, there's such a part of lifting and football that are so ingrained, whereas hockey really doesn't have that. Like, again, it's getting a lot better and, Guys are starting to understand that, but there's, I still, I still think there's a bit of a miss there in terms of that. So, you know, when it comes to planning, for me, it's really dependent on the type of athlete that I have. If I know it's a guy that will do the right things and, you know, be a pro, you know, it, it revolves around what that player needs, similar to what you would do as well, right? It's, there's not as many positions, obviously, with hockey, like there's, you know, defense, offense, and goalies. I would say that I don't work with as many goalies just because they're uh, like kickers almost, right? They're kind of a, the odd ducks of the sport. Um, you know, the ones that I have worked with have been incredible athletes uh, just in terms of like raw natural ability, but not guys that are real dialed into training necessarily. You know, so um, the guys that I would work with is, um, a little more nuts and bolts, a little simpler for the most part, just like, you know, a, a forward player, whereas the body types in football vary so much, you know, like just the mass of guys compared to a skill position guy or, or whatever. Whereas in hockey, they're a little bit more normal in terms of stature and size and what have you. So I think it opens up the door to, you know, just kind of exploring some different movements, different range of motion, you know, what have you, getting a little more creative. And that's what I find myself doing now because it's you're dealing with a population that not necessarily the uh, the majority of them that are real crazy about training, you know, like real crazy about, you know, lifting weights. There's a big thing now with with guys that don't want to get too big, you know, and it's ridiculous because they're not going to get too big. But that's yeah. kind of you've had some of these old school coaches that have kind of scared off some of these guys in hockey. Um which again is, is kind of ridiculous, but it's changed my training because, you know, I have to adapt to the athlete to some degree. Right. And I'll just, you know, we, we end up doing more movement work, more field work, you know, more sprinting, you know, because I think that's a, the game is so much faster now. So we end up kind of leaning towards like just open field work more, you know, and, you know, more manual resistance stuff, more band work more. And again, I'm from a football background, so I know the value of lifting but I also know the value of, you know, making sure the client is getting what they need, right. Yeah. And making sure that we're still, I can just, you know, like any good coach, you can disguise stuff in training that they don't really know why they're doing what they're doing necessarily every single time. So it's, I think there's a touch of creativity there as well in terms of how do you get the athlete to do what you know they need to do and making sure that they're still enjoying it because that's something that, you know, like I said, if you go into a football environment, it's like, yeah, they know they have to lift. They know they have to be X, but hockey's just not like that. There's guys that still get away with very minimal training. Um, it catches up with them, of course, but it's a little bit tougher when it comes to that buy-in. Makes sense. How, um, one of the biggest like hot topics now is like sprinting for ice hockey. Mm -hmm. People ask me all the time, like, what would you do? And I'm like, I actually have no idea. Um, obviously from like a physiological standpoint, I would, I know how to program it, but from a technical standpoint, like how important is the technical side and how would you do, or how have you done speed work for hockey? I think you talked to Mike Boyle, right? At, at yeah. Some point. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, Mike's been a mentor of mine for forever, you know, so he's one of the, if not the go-to guy in hockey, which rightfully so. 
um, you know, and he's done a ton of this, you know, research and, you know, in the, in the trenches research, you know, with figuring shit out and it's, it's helped a lot with the rest of us type thing. I've been going to see him since I was working for the Toronto Maple Leafs, you know, 15 years ago. And um, it's, well, first of all, hockey players are atrocious sprinters for the most part and runners, right? Because the, uh, yeah. you would cringe. Um, actually, sorry, they are getting better, but historically very bad sprinters uh, because back in the day, you know, a lot of the hockey conditioning work was done on a bike. Got you know, it. one of my first clients, Adam Foote, who's a guy won everything, Olympic gold medal, Stanley Cups, very mean, you know, very strong. He could ride a bike for 80 minutes at the most grueling pace you've ever seen. But if you asked him to sprint, it'd be a different story, right? So it's just how the sport has evolved now where sprinting is seen as a, you know, as a needed attribute, right, to some degree. But for me personally, I don't, I don't go overkill with like actual, actual technical cueing yeah. other than maybe like three or four cues. And, and most of them just come from shin angle. They come from, you know, uh, I call it like positional strength, yeah. you know, like coming out of a lateral position, you know, turning the hips over into a sprint and then just managing upper body. You know, and, and I know that's super general, but you get a lot of the hockey guys because of the posture is so rolled forward in gameplay and practice. So their posture is here. You know, they, they end up running like this. They run and you can see kind of all their neck muscles are just fired and they're clenching their jaw. Like if I, if I can alleviate that a little bit, it changes their form drastically, as you can imagine, right? Like, and I refer to like, hey, you ever watch the Olympics? You watch, you know, um i can't remember who the fast guy is right now but they walk they run with they smooth is fast yeah, right you have to be smooth you have to be relaxed to be fast and i think just some of those simple things alone to somebody who's you know holding tension and you know trying to grind their way through a sprint instead of move well through it and and you know uh, frequency and strength or uh, stride frequency and length as opposed to you know, grinding through it, like I said, will change the whole dynamic of the sprint, right? Yeah. So I think keeping it simple and, and not not trying to make them something they're not, you know, and right. overkill on, you know, hand position and perfect, like it's just not going to work, you know? Hey, if, if I get a guy or a group of guys that are into it, I'll go a little bit deeper for sure. You know, we'll, you know, talk about some more. Another thing is toe pulling, right? They all they all run like this because their anterior tibs are so weak from being locked in a carbon fiber skate boot, uh, you know, right? So a lot of guys at the start of the off season get some shin splints and, you know, you know, stuff like that. So we'll do a lot of like barefoot stuff early on ankle mobility, flexibility stuff early on tib fib stuff early on totally um, not have to deal with that just yeah, because they're, yeah their front shank is so like underused and yeah. even like underdeveloped you see yeah. hockey guys have no calves it's crazy yeah. that's so true it's like a lot of um i mean a lot of the research we're doing in sprinting is based around swing leg retraction how the leg contacts the ground contact mm -hmm. times which obviously on the ice you don't have a lot of swing leg retraction you don't have contact time so how does it transfer to, to ice skating you know what like there isn't there's a couple of folks that are doing some, you know, research with, you know, with speed, Devin McConnell from, uh, uh, he's used to be with, uh, UMass Lowell and, and then Jersey and now he's with Arizona. A guy that would be good to talk to. He does a lot of, uh, on ice research. He has the, you know, the time to do that with his title or whatever. Uh, Matt Price from the LA Kings, who's a guy I should definitely connect you with. Yeah. Um, he's doing a lot of that as well. And, you know, if, if it was me and Mike Boyle talking about this, I think he would say something similar and it revolves around if a hockey player can sprint fast off the ice, nine times out of 10, they're going to sprint fast on the yeah, ice. Yeah, makes sense. And now, I'm assuming that's extensor, hip extensor strength has a lot to do with that. I think so. I think it's, it's kind of like that, you know, traction. Yeah. Like it, it's just, if you see someone off the ice who just, 
you know, struggles with, you know, even those little bit of technical cueing and you go on the ice and it's like, yeah, they're just, it's just sloppy or it's not efficient or it's whatever. And it's the learning how to skate or changing someone's stride is so difficult because we get them at, you know, they're already a professional, right? So yes, they need to work on their skating or, or whatever, but they've already learned how to skate. Like you can't, you can't go back. Right. So I think for me and my son's nine and he's, you know, getting into hockey now and he's, whatever, he's playing like crazy. And it's like, I've been so focused on making sure that he's a good skater, you know, and not that I have any, you know, grand. And, and, and what is, I mean, catch off, what is a good skater? Like how is there, what are the kinematics of like a good skate stride? Is there like a technical model for skating the way they're sprinting? <sighs> Yes, there is, but it's not as concrete as sprinting. I think because yeah. there's been so many good sprinters and like you see a lot of the same qualities in those, you know, good sprinters, or whether it's like, um, you know, length and frequency correlation or, you know, whatever, any of the stuff that Dan Paff talks about, you know, that just that smoothness. Skating, yes, but I think a, a couple common things are body position. You know, the best skaters are just that lower to the ground, right? They understand where they need to be to actually put force into the ice, you know, to really propel themselves as opposed to, you know, being on top of the ice, if that makes sense. They understand getting into the ground and like pushing the ground away. Um, I think the other thing too, is just using the right muscles. And it sounds super simple, but you know, when you extend the leg at the hip, like is the glute firing and supporting that, you know, do you have hip stability or is it just jelly, you know, like, are you, can you, when you put your foot in the ground, does that grab, you know, does that give you the power? And you'd be surprised like professional guys at the start of our off season that just can't do that. Like a simple wall drill, like a sprinting wall drill that just, they can't eventually they do obviously, but it's um, yeah. I, I think those, you know, simple qualities that you would probably across the board say, you know, really good low position yeah. you know, the ability to, you, you know, fire that backside and really that, that, that's where it's coming from. You know, you see hockey guys with big quads and no ass. Yeah. That's a problem, you know, yeah. because they're, they're skating with their quads. They're not able to sustain it because their quads fill up and they just can't keep doing it. And they, it becomes super inefficient. Um, you know, and I think that's, you know, those two qualities alone would make a substantial difference, but it's, yeah it becomes very difficult because all these kids are learning how to skate. Like there's no curriculum on how to skate. You know, there's no, there's commonalities, but they're very, it's a gray thing. You know what I mean? Like if you can find a really good coach, really young, that's massive. Yeah. What, why aren't they using speed skating coaches? I spent some time with us speed skating. And I was Is that there. Andrew? Um, this was in, um, Oh, before park city. Okay. He's yeah. in Cali. Um, yeah, because speed skating is just different. Like, yeah, to be honest, yeah. a lot of the best hockey uh, skate instructors are from figure skating. Got it. Yeah, I work with, um, when I was with Toronto with Barb Underhill, and she still works for the Leafs. And I still work with one of her partners, Tracy Tutton, who they had, like, this is a long time ago, but they were one of the first people I've seen using dart fish, you know. In yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Technical you know, so, and she was also one of the first to, you know, relate it to the gym. Like I'm the first person that she wanted to talk to because it's like, this guy can't get low enough and he can't get into his glutes. And I'm like, Oh, mm, in, in the skate know. side. It yeah. Like similar to, I would say from a velocity standpoint point, it seems like it would be similar to basketball where early acceleration is a lot more important than peak yeah. velocity. Um, do they, in hockey, and this is more like just for my knowledge, but in hockey, do they test like a peak velocity? Like I know they test like a, a sprint test on skates, but is there like a peak velocity metric? And in a game, how often would they hit that metric if there is one? I wouldn't say there's a standard one. You know what I mean? Like there is no, that's a problem with hockey too. Like historically, it's just not there, you know, yeah. whereas you could look at American football, you could look at soccer, rugby, they have like really good or really, uh, 
in-depth historical knowledge and hockey just you know isn't there because a lot of it you know even for like the big nhl combine which is a far you know a shadow of what the nfl combine is they don't even do any on ice testing mm. right? so think about that like it, it's the sport is still not fully understanding what that means or what yeah. to even test right yeah. so I don't know if I even have an answer for that. I think there's, there's things that, you know, some of the guys that I mentioned are working on, you know, to validate, Hey, is, does this, matter? you know, does it, does peak velocity matter in a, you know, probably a 10 yard to 15 yard distance? I would say it does. Right. Yeah. Because, and this is just my own belief, but I feel like most sports are played in the 10 by 10 yard box. You yeah. know, if you can get your first three to five steps and get to the ball, the puck or whatever first, and you're in a good position to, you know, stop and know what to do with the the play next, you're going to win. You know, if you're out of control, but you get there first, but you don't know what to do because you're shit position or whatever, you know, I, I try to teach my athletes that it's, you know, we're going to move well, but we're going to move with control, you know, and I think that's, it's easy to say, but it's, you get these guys that have these big engines and they, they want to go places, but they don't have the the fluidity or the smoothness to like get in and out of those positions. Yeah. You know, with, yeah. with efficiency. I would be interested to see some of the sprint metrics done on ice. Like for example, and I, I, and then see that, see if they produce that same signature off the ice, for example, like off the ice, let's measure how much horizontal force they produce in the early acceleration, how mm-hmm. much power they produce what velocity do they reach and what does their acceleration curve look like? Like how long does it take them to accelerate? Like, or how long is their acceleration part? Meaning mm-hmm. like how long does it take to reach their peak velocity and what's the drop off from that peak acceleration metric? And then look at hockey and say on sk- on ice, do you have the same level of acceleration or force ability and how quickly does it drop off and look at some other things like, um, I think a cool one would be like hit projection distance. So from zero on that first stride, how fast does your hit project and how far? I I guess it would be different because there's no like, we use touchdown distance. So how far is your foot touchdown from your center? But maybe, um, hmm. Well, it's interesting too, because, you know, in, in watching you guys do your thing on the field, that one thing that, if I only took one thing from it, which I took many, but it was that word of projection to me that just totally like, yeah, like that's the word, that's the word that I've been looking for, but not been able to use or not been able to find. And now when I say that to guys, it's like for the majority that that light comes on because so many hockey guys will just pop out and then go. Yeah. For whatever reason. And I start talking to them like, look, I'm not going to, tell you how to play hockey that's a bad idea but the things that i'm talking about that we're doing on the field about projecting out first and then rise with your body yep. right like that type of i said that's that can transfer directly to hockey yeah the fact that you're popping up out of the whether you have like, skates on or not is not good you know like yeah. as simple as that is that's not good it's about pushing out first and i think there's so many and we've done some on and off ice, like, you know, that 10 meter sprint um, correlation. And a lot of the time their off ice sprint is faster because of, in my opinion, technical skating ability. Mm. And that goes back to what I said before, like there is no real system to teach skating that is like universally. And like with sprinting, I think you would probably agree that there's definitely more of like a, you know pathway to elite sprinting right like there's, yeah, definitely there's more... just a lot of different theories like right right you know, having none is almost better than having a hundred million right it's like i mean yeah. the road is is muddied is is very muddied but um yeah that makes that makes a ton of sense but yeah, that, that projection in, key man is is huge for me because it's you know i feel like a lot of hockey guys they they and you'll understand this like they they level change too much you know like especially moving laterally or even accelerating like why are you coming up 
you know, why are you changing that? And you talk about hip projection. Uh, that's an interesting one to me too, because like so many of these young guys are, are popping up or changing levels too many times. And I'm, I mean, my thought, my response to them is like, you're wasting energy. Yeah. Like that takes work, yeah. you know, like learn how to play low and stay low and you're going to be a lot more efficient and you're going to be able to move better, you know? So that's one of the things that, that, that clicks with me. Is there a, um, okay. Cause like in sprinting, we have air time. So it's like, you have a contact, you leave the contact into air time and your air time is like supposed to be average. It's not supposed to be good or bad. It's just somewhere in the middle. Is there something similar for skating, like glide time between strides or between touchdowns or is there um, anything like that? Or is that, am I off on that? No, no, no. Uh, there, um, uh, it's funny, Matt Price and I were talking about this. There is like, um, there is a glide time. There's a glide time and there's a return to, I don't know what he, how, how he described it, like a return to the skate underneath the hips, almost like a cycle, I guess, for sprinting. Yeah. Um, I can't reference the numbers. I'm not going to even try, but um, yes, there, there are those metrics. It's just nobody's really put meaning to them. And I don't mean it that in a bad way. I just said like, it's just not common enough yet to say, oh yeah, it's this because yeah. Again, I think it goes back to the fact that it's the wild west in terms of, oh, this is how you teach someone how to skate. Right. You know, like, right. And then you ask the best skaters, and the, in my opinion, the best is I rate as smoothness, right? As as it's just like you would in sprinting. You watch Usain Bolt sprint; it looks effortless. Yeah. Right. Like it's just you know you exchange him with anybody that he's racing against. The same thing, right? Like it it's effortless when you see a good skater it looks like they're not trying yeah, because they're yeah. just so efficient. Yeah. Makes um, sense. Like in sprinting, it's kind of interesting because like a lot of people are reverse engineered, like, Oh, it's, let's take Usain Bolt. Here's his frequency. Here's his length. But he's a little bit of an anomaly. Right. He actually had relatively average frequency. Really? But yeah. If you look at, I mean, the average in terms of the rest of the field, like right. obviously it's the rest of the world. But he had such ridiculous length because obviously his, his legs are longer um, and he had great horizontal projection and strength. But um, a lot of times in sprinting, people try to fit people into a box like, oh, this guy ran five, uh, five hertz frequency. Like you need to run five hertz frequency. But some of that's determined by uh, mom and dad and some of that, <laughs> <laughs> some of that you can you can fix so but yeah no i'm i'm really i've been watching the figure skaters over i'm i'm at where your old job was so yeah yeah i'm i'm watching them every day oh, they're incredible man absolutely like, incredible yeah i haven't seen the ducks practice i'm assuming i don't know anything about nhl are they out of season no no it's it's yeah. on right now they're they're playing a uh, 56 game schedule what yeah i need to i need to pop my head in there one day yeah man i heard they have a 1080 and they don't use it so well that's one of the things that I bought that they don't use. So I, I'll connect you with Matt Price. You, you'd enjoy chatting with him. And yeah, 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 connect me for sure. Cause I got some yeah. ideas. I built a, um, actually I just did this with a, with a couple of us soccer players. One of them, she was coming out of college and she was looking to play professional, make the national team, but she felt like maybe it's like a, a bigger gap for me to get there. Cause in her position, she needs to be the fastest person on the field. And she was running like around 18, 18, five miles per hour, which is good. It's fast, but she's like, I need to be at 20. So we took 12 weeks and just built a program. And essentially all we did was created a load velocity profile. So we determined where her peak power was. We determined what 50% of her peak velocity was. So I think she was running 8.1 meters per second. So her peak velocity ended up being like 4.05. Then we find a resistance to match up with that. We trained her at that. So we trained her at that resistance. I think it was like 23 kg on the 1080. So once she broke through that, that barrier and she was running 4.1, 4.2 meters per second with that weight, we dropped it. And then we went to a, a different decrement of velocity. So we went to a 40% decrement of velocity. So now her next phase was like, she had to hit five meters per second. So we just kept doing that all the way down until she started running high velocity. Hmm. Outcome was she ran 20.6 miles per hour. 
Jesus. And um, had her first start on the U.S. national team. She ran the fastest time in camp, um, the fastest, like the highest velocity in camp. Wow. And then scored her first goal two minutes into her first start. Huh. Um, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's it's insane. So we it was a it was a theory we were playing around with all year, all summer, testing, testing, testing. Oh, that didn't work, throw it out. And what we were doing early on is we were doing the heavy sled stuff, but we were going too far. So we were hmm. having them run like 20 meters. And when we looked at the data, they were hitting their peak velocities at like five or six meters. So the rest of it just ended up being speed endurance. So right. what we did is we shortened the amount. So we figured out where do they hit their velocity and just literally track it. So they're, they're hitting that velocity, but only in a capped area of time. And then our early acceleration period was like, we, it was more of an accumulation, more hypertrophy, more, it's more concentric. So we were doing more reps and as we got faster, less reps. So really simple, push the mm -hmm. distance further, do less reps as you get faster. Then we did it again. And, um, we did it with another player, same thing, same result. So anyway, like with combine, kind of the same thing, same philosophy. But what I went, what I was thinking about from a, a hockey perspective, it to me it seems like a lot of it is physiological changes versus technical. So like for my for the combine guys that I'm working with, I give them like a full like, here's an eight week progression, and a lot of the changes are going to be physical, but there's also a lot of technical stuff. I got to teach you the three point start. I got to teach you the timing, um, getting into frequency. You should get into your peak frequency within like a step or two, at least 90% of it. So here's how you do that. There's a lot of technical things because a lot of it has to do with how they swing that leg into the ground. But for hockey, I feel like it would work even better because the physiological changes that drive that entire process that I just gave, are massive are massive if i if i had a perfectly technical athlete i could take them from eight meters per second to 10 meters per second in a few weeks so well, that's, yeah yeah I, it's interesting because again you, you talk about the difference between like you know the football um graduation or the football lineage right and it's like by the time they get to the age of 20 21 they have like four to six years of training age built up yeah right like for the most part right like you know your last year of high school and then maybe you know obviously four years of ncaa like that's that's your training age that's what you're building and you get to the nfl you know how to lift right you know you know what you can lift for the most part well hockey's the opposite yeah so they get drafted at 18 and so you get drafted in june typically at 18 years old. So you're playing junior hockey, which is like, uh, uh, like a feeder league, right. To, to the pros. And when they come to our development camp, they're coming at a training age of, you know, zero to one, mm. literally, you know, like maybe they spent, you know, a summer of training, but to me, that's still under one, you know, they haven't really, and it goes back to, you know, the, culture of hockey and it's just you know they'll work out a couple times a week in junior who knows if they have a street coach who knows if they even have a gym you know so it's still not it's better it's a lot better but it's not where it should be right so when they get past at the pros when they're 18 you're you're starting from scratch so mm -hmm. like you're right if i put 15 pounds on this kid and you know put 15 pounds of muscle on this kid and teach him how to lift yeah his skating's gonna get better whether he's a shit skater or not, like it can get better because he can put his foot in the ground now and you yeah. know do something, right? So that's where, you know, by the again, by the time they're 18, they're already labeled as a you know good skater, bad skater, or someone who can improve. Like it's that simple, right? So yeah. if you have a, a good skater who's underdeveloped physically, well then all we have to really do is develop him physically and you're gonna see some big changes. And I think yeah. that's you know, you're starting to see that more now with even some of my older players, you know, I commented to a guy the other night, I'm like, man, you look fast, you know, like just the way that you're navigating the ice and whatever I said, like, he's like, yeah, I feel really good. I said, he's like, I don't feel, you know, like I, I'm fast necessarily, but I feel like I can keep that same speed my whole shift. I'm like, yeah, well, that's the idea. Like is, 
the less gearing up you have to do to get that speed is similar to what you're talking about. Like you should be playing at 80%. Like that's a, and yeah. the, the number is arbitrary, but no, if you can play, true. yeah, if you can play a little faster, if you can play in fourth gear and all you have to do is, you know, punch in for, you know, get up to a hundred, like that's efficiency. It's 100%. not to yeah. play in second gear and work all the way up. We were just talking about that because, um, Williams from the Chiefs, he, he had a good day, good game, touchdown, like 50 yards, hit 90 um, last game. And then Tyree Kill, I, got, I saw both of those guys um, this year just kind of develop a little bit. And with mm -hmm. Tyree, like, I saw him run a ton this summer. We were in Texas, and um, I saw him running. And he, he can hit a velocity of, like, close to 24, if not higher. Like, he, he's fast and they're going crazy over these, these games where he's running 20 miles per hour, 20 miles per hour, 20 miles per hour. And I'm like, that's sub max for him. He he's doing that. He, he's blowing past guys. Easy. He could have eight, eight game, eight plays in a game that are above 20 miles per hour easily and not be tapped from it because he has such a high uh, velocity. So that ends up being a, an acceleration, which you have much higher threshold. Um, but yeah, and I, and I look at hockey and I'm looking at, it's pretty similar to how other field sports are. If you have to, if 15 miles per hour is your, your peak and you're doing runs at 12, 13, 14 miles per hour all game, it's going to be really hard for you to be efficient later in the game. And you're going to feel, and your coach is going to say, oh, you need to do more cardio. Right. No, you need, <laughs> you need to get a little faster so that 15 miles per hour becomes extremely submaximal. And you can repeat that over and over and over again. Well, you know, what's funny too, man. And this sounds, you know, maybe kind of dumb, but uh, the, the other thing with ice is that, you know, you only can go so far. Yeah. Right. Like you, and that, I think, I think that speaks to experience. And like, when I talk about a good skater, in my opinion, yes, you're technically proficient at the actual, you know, skating motion, whatever that, whatever that you figure out that is, but you also know how to navigate the ice really well, right? Like, you know, that if you're at your top end speed and you're not worried about crashing into the boards yeah. and, you know, physically hurting yourself, you know, very violently. And I think that's, you know, a big part of it because if you don't know how to navigate the ice, if you're not comfortable, I mean, it's dangerous. Like it's super dangerous. These guys are going, you know, with, sharp blades on their feet and sticks in their hands and you know obviously there's body contact they're smashing into each other so like i think there's another layer there of of whether you want to call it confidence or i, I like calling it navigation because i think the guys understand that you know i tell them you know when you're navigating the ice like you know if you're a defenseman if you're a you know stay-at-home defenseman which is basically like you know somebody who just gets the puck off a guy and gives it to the other members of his team right so if you're a stay at home guy, you're pretty simple, right? You're not real great at any one thing, but you're kind of good at everything and you do your job, but you don't do anything but that. He probably has, you know, four or five paths that he takes on the ice during a game, like tops. So I'm trying to simplify those decisions to improve the confidence of the athlete, right? So if you, if you know, you only have to do three to five things within your position let's get really fucking good at those things yeah let's do them better right like let's you got to go from this dot and into the corner and back okay well, we're going to work on that like i don't think you got to make that guy what you call a defenseman who's going to skate up the ice and try to score a goal or whatever this guy's not doing that like so let's simplify him right like it almost be like a lineman right like you got to do two things, pass block or run block. That's it. So why are we working on, you know, a dive route or whatever that, you know what I mean? Like, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, so that's a big part of it too. Yeah. I love it. Well, yeah, I want to be respectful of your time, man. This has been awesome. I really appreciate it. Yeah. I got to, uh, I've got to put some kids to bed here, but we yeah, should do it yeah. again, man. Like in, uh, I, I like this kind of format too, just kind of shooting the shit. We should yeah, get Maddie yeah. on too. And uh, he'll be able to get into the technical stuff way more. And he is married to the 1080. I think he's okay. one of the first guys in the NHL to get uh, the 1080 and the quantum rack. He's got a whole big setup. He, he works right. with those guys too. So he's a well, really- Where is he based out of? 
LA. Okay. He's with yeah. the Kings. He's with the Kings. Yeah. He's been there. Um, he's a head of sports science now. He's done really well for himself. Just, you know, implementing what he wants, you know, the program and whatever. And he's, uh, he's done a fantastic job and he's a Canadian yeah. guy too. Okay. Dope. Yeah. I'd love, <laughs> I'd love to even just compare 1080 data. Cause I, I have 30, 40 NFL guys on there. And it's interesting cause that, but I don't, I don't have anyone else in that's right. using it. Um, on a, NFL players that I can compare and then NHL, I have a MLB guys on it too now. So yeah, it's like, it'll be really nice to see what, what they got going on. Yeah, man, for sure. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll make sure to connect you guys because it, it'll be worth your time. Okay. Yeah, no, I'd love to. I appreciate that. Yeah, man, anytime. Yeah, I've been listening to him on, um, I think he's on Pacey. Probably. Yeah, I listen to him on Pacey. Yeah, yeah. All right, man, we'll put the kids to bed. We'll catch up soon. Right, Come man. down and visit us during Combine if you can. I know. I would love to. Believe me, I got some business down there too, but it's, uh, I can't do the quarantine. I don't have, like, if I do it, I can come there, but I can't, if I came, when I come back, I got a quarantine for two weeks. So like, Oh yeah. Until that sense. changes, I'm not coming. So hopefully it'll change soon. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I appreciate you, man. We'll talk yeah, soon. Man. Yeah, man. All the best. All right. Peace.